When I began here at Langford, it never occurred to me that I would do so many funerals. Um, three very special people to us died the first year that I was here, and then um, two the next, and then five the next, and then three the next, and then five the next, and I think I've had 25 funerals now. That's 25 times that I've helped a family to lay uh, a loved one to rest. And that has given me an interesting insight into graveside services, into being in the valley of the shadow of death. And I'll tell you that in that moment, there is no better scripture verse passage than the one that we're going to look at today. That's John chapter 11, Jesus and, and Lazarus. John 11, I think, is the perfect passage because it, well, for two reasons. One, it, it aches with the pain that all of us are feeling in that. We've all been at the graveside. We've all lost loved ones. You know the pain that it feels. Uh, and, and, and the passage meets us in that. And yet at the same time, John chapter 11 also holds out to us the hope that, that the grave is not the end of the story. Death is, is not the end. <laughs> John chapter 11 gives us all that we need, the hope that we need to face death, whether our own or that of a loved one, with Christ-like confidence. So join me in um, John chapter 11. John chapter 11, and I'll, and I'll show you why it is that I say that. Now, as um, John chapter 11 opens, we meet a man whose name is Lazarus, and Lazarus was sick. Uh, I, I assume you remember the sisters, Mary and Martha. Give me a nod if you remember Mary and Martha. Um, it turns out that they also have a brother, and his name is Lazarus. And they all lived together in a house um, not too far from Jerusalem. Uh, they lived at, at Bethany. Uh, Lazarus and his sisters, it turns out, were good friends of Jesus. And so when the sisters, um, uh, when, when Lazarus got sick, the sisters sent off to Jesus to say, the one that you love is, is sick. Now, verse 4, when Jesus heard this, he said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory, so that God's Son may be glorified through it. Just like with the blind man last week, Jesus knows that what is about to happen is meant not just to be a healing, but to be a demonstration of God's power at work in the world. Now, verse 5 says, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, and yet, when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was for two more days. That's kind of odd, isn't it? If Jesus loved Mary and Martha and Lazarus, why did he not just drop everything and rush straight for their home instead of waiting where he was for two more days? We'll find out in a minute. But when the time was right, two days later, he said, verse 7, let us go back to Judea. But, Rabbi, they said, uh, a short while ago, the Jews tried to stone you, and yet you are going back there? That, that's true. <laughs> the last time that Jesus was in Judea, he's up in the north right now in Galilee, he's going to come down south. The last time that Jesus was in um, Judea, he was nearly stoned to death. That's John chapter 10, verse 31. The, 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 the leaders picked up stones to kill him, but, but Jesus is not going to let the threat of uh, <clears throat> stoning stop him from accomplishing what it is that God has put before him to do. So verse 9, Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours of daylight in a day? A man who walks by day will not stumble, for he sees the world's light. It is when he walks by night that he stumbles. For he has no light. Jesus knows he has a job to do, and he's not going to let anything prevent him from accomplishing it. Well, after this, he um, went on to tell them, listen, our friend Lazarus is asleep. 
He's fallen asleep. But I'm going there to wake him up. Now the disciples, of course, um, hear this, and they think, oh, strictly on human terms, this is good. Verse 12, uh, his disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, then he will get better. Right? Uh, that, that's just how the human body works. You don't need to go and be his alarm clock, Jesus. Surely this sleep will heal him, and he'll wake up himself. But Jesus said, no, Lazarus is, is dead. And for your sake, I'm glad that we were not there, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Um, the, the, the news, I'm sure, of Lazarus' death was a huge bombshell. Right? They're all friends with him. And yet there is the further bombshell that Jesus' delay actually let his death happen. <laughs> and yet, Jesus says, if we had rushed to Bethany, he may be alive, but I would have deprived you of the opportunity to see my healing, restoring, resurrecting power at work. So he says, I have power over life and death. I'm not concerned about Lazarus. I'm more concerned that you have the opportunity to believe. So Thomas called Didymus, the twin, said to the rest of the disciples, well, let us go also that we may die with him. Weird thing to say. Um, the disciples have a habit of just kind of blurting things out. Um, unless, unless you realize that if Jesus goes to Judea, then he's in danger. And if Jesus is in danger, then his disciples are in danger. And so Thomas seems to be saying, well, let us go, whatever the outcome may be. So off they went uh, uh, to Bethany, which is about a two days walk. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had been in the tomb for four days. Now, Bethany, where they lived, was about two miles from Jerusalem. And, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and to Mary to comfort them in the loss of, of their brother. Uh, evidently, Mary and Martha and Lazarus were an important, influential family um, because uh, people in the big city cared enough to walk out to them to, um, uh, to, to mourn with them in the passing of their brother Lazarus. So imagine, if you would, they kind of walked from here to the Tim Hortons up the road. That's essentially the distance that we're dealing with here. They came from Jerusalem out to Bethany to be with, uh, to be with Mary and Martha uh, in, their, in their mourning. Now, <clears throat> when, uh, when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went right out to meet him. But Mary stayed home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my, my brother would not have died. But even now, I, I know that God will give you whatever you ask. Put yourself in Martha's shoes right now. Consider the storm of emotions that she is feeling. She has just watched her brother waste away fairly quickly, knowing full well that they have a friend who is able to give sight to the blind and heal paralytic people, and yet, as far as she's concerned, he's dilly-dallied and not come right to them. She thinks if Jesus had only been there, my brother would be alive. I think this reflects the, the, the disappointment that she feels, right? The, the, the sorrow, this frustration, she takes it right to Jesus and lays it honestly at his feet. And notice here that Jesus doesn't scold her for it, right? He knows that this is how we pray when we are hurting inside. But notice, too, that, that Martha is not grieving hopelessly here. Yes, she is hurting. Yes, she is laying out before the Lord, pouring out her heart before the Lord quite honestly. And yet she is doing it from a place of faith. Right? She says, now, even in the face of death, I know, Lord, that, that God will do whatever you ask. She is convinced, absolutely convinced, that Jesus is able to work something good out of this sad situation. 
In response to that, verse 23, Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I, 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 know, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at, at the last day. Clearly, Martha has been paying attention in synagogue. She understands that the Old Testament, their scriptures, point to a resurrection at the end of the age. And so she is convinced that, that she will see her brother again, that he will live again on the last day. But Jesus isn't going to make her wait that long. Verse 25, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me, even if he dies, will never truly die. Do you believe this? This is one of the reasons that I love this passage. Jesus lays it out so clearly and so succinctly. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the power of life over death. I am victory over the grave. If anyone believes in me dies, then they've not truly died. They will live again. And if anyone lives and, and believes in me, then they will never truly die. Jesus holds this out to Martha and says, do you believe it? Verse 27, yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God who has come into the world to deliver us from death and give us light. Now, now this is a fascinating insight in and of itself. In a time when um, education for women was not a priority, Martha proves to be way more insightful than any of the male disciples. This is, this is one of the most profound theological statements in all of the Gospels. Martha is the one who says, Jesus, I know who you are. You are the Messiah that God has sent, the promised one that we've been waiting for all this time to make good on all that God has promised. Sometimes um, Martha, I think, gets a bad rap. Right over in Luke, she's the busy lady who's too busy to choose what's really important. She's busy serving Jesus. And yet here, this passage tells me she's sat at Jesus' feet long enough to understand now who he is. Verse 28, after, after she had said this, she went back and and called her sister Mary aside that the teacher is here and, and he is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and, and went to him. Now, Jesus had, had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met uh, him. When the Jews who had been at Martha's house saw her get up uh, and noticed how quickly she left, she got up and went out following her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to, to, to mourn. So there is a crowd gathering, okay? When, when Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet said, Lord, if you had been here, brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and, and troubled. Again, an interesting thing about this account is, is that I think it reflects the personalities of Mary and Martha very well here. You get the sense from the Bible that Mary is the is the left uh, excuse me that Martha is the left brain sister right she's rational she's logical she's analytical she's mourning and Jesus engages her in in theological reflection. Mary on the other hand she's the right brain one she's emotional she's here at Jesus' feet and starts crying and yet for all their differences they say the very same thing Lord if you been here, my brother would not have died. And again, Jesus meets her where she's at. 
He doesn't scold her for a lack of faith. He meets her in her pain. I think he knew that Martha needed to process this from a theological point of view. And yet for Mary, she needed a shoulder to cry on. And so Jesus stood there and felt the depth of pain of loss to the point that he was deeply disturbed in his spirit, it says. 34, where have you laid him? He asked, come and see, Lord. And they brought him to the place, and there at the graveside, Jesus wept. That's the shortest verse in the English Bible. But it is one of the most profound. Jesus is not unmoved by death. He is not disinterested in loss. He knows the pain of it. He knows the sorrow that it brings. This is not abstract resurrection to him. This is a close friend that he has lost. He knows what it's like to lose a loved one, to mourn them. And here he is deeply moved in spirit. When we're in that place, he is there with us. Unlike us, though, Jesus can do something about it. Verse 36, the Jews said, see how he loved him. But, but some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man uh, have kept this man from dying? Right? They're thinking the same thing as the sisters did. If Jesus had been here, he, he could have used his power to keep him alive. Why didn't he use his power to keep him alive? Verse 38, Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, as if to rub it in, by this time there is a bad odor, for he has been in there for four days. Ever logical, Martha, right? Then Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of those standing here, that they may, be, that they may believe that you have sent me. Well, now we have the answer to the question, why did Jesus not rush here? Why did Jesus not use his power to keep him alive? Jesus didn't use his power to keep him alive so that he could use the even he could use that power for the even greater miracle of raising Lazarus to life and more importantly inspiring faith in the crowd who has seen it. Jesus didn't just want to heal a sick man. He wanted to raise a dead man to give these people unassailable reason to understand that he is truly the resurrection and the life. And Mary and Martha both said, Lord, if you had been here, our brother would not have died. Now Jesus says to them, if I had been here, then you would have missed out on the most amazing opportunity to see my power at work and believe who I truly am. And so he prays that the crowd gathered around would understand that what he is about to do is done by the power of God. I mean, it, it's sort of a funny thing he prays, right? Father, I thank you for hearing me. That suggests to me that he's already prayed for Lazarus to be raised to life again. Right? He has probably praised for he's probably prayed for Lazarus' resurrection way back at the beginning when he told his disciples that Lazarus was already gone. Here now his prayer is, O oh Lord, let these people see and believe. So, verse 43, when he said that, Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out. His hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Jesus raised the dead man to life. Verse 40, 45, therefore, because of this, 
Many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did put their faith in him. They saw what happened. They understood what happened, and they believed. Right? That, was, that was Jesus' point in this all along. He didn't want to just say that he was the resurrection and the life. He wanted to prove that he could resurrect people and truly give them life. And so Jesus raised Lazarus to, uh, to life again. Because Jesus is the resurrection and the life, he resurrected Lazarus and gave him life. And that's what Jesus promises to us when we believe in him. Like to Martha, Jesus says to each of us, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even if he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never truly die. Do you believe this? Jesus asks that of each of us. Do you believe that Jesus is the resurrection and the life, the power of life over death? Do you believe that Jesus is the one sent by God to take away the issue of sin that separates from God and separates us from God and gives us the ability to come to him? When we believe in Jesus, he will resurrect us and give us life just as he did for Lazarus. When we put our faith in him, we will too one day hear his voice call out, Lazarus, come out. Jim, come out. Janet, come out. Graham, come out. When we put our faith in Jesus, the resurrection and the life, he will resurrect us and give us life. What do we do with that knowledge? Let me give you three things. First, um, let this, let this occasion in the book of John deepen your faith in Jesus as the resurrection and the life. Right, again and again in this passage, Jesus tells us the point here is not that he raised a man to life. The point is that the resurrection of a man calls us to believe. In a sense, Jesus raising Lazarus Lazarus to death is, a, is an object lesson for each of us, meant to demonstrate, to, to, to deepen our faith in, in Jesus. So, so let this story be fuel to your faith. Um, two, let Lazarus' encounter with Jesus give you, give you courage in, in the face of death. I know, I know, I know, I know. I know we don't like to talk about our own mortality, um, but the reality is that it is a reality that we will all face. This passage says to us, God says to us through this passage, that when we believe in Jesus, he will resurrect us and give us life. Let that give you hope as that day comes. Just imagine what it will be like to live in a glorified body like this, but not limited like this. Uh, one of the commentators that I read, Gary Burge, um, this week had a very insightful um, thought. Uh, imagine for a moment, he says, Lazarus's death as, excuse me. Imagine for a moment, Lazarus's thoughts as he laid on his second deathbed, right? Lazarus was resurrected in John 11, but he, he, he died again. Normal feelings of worry and doubt uh, were probably in the corners of his soul, but he had confidence knowing that Jesus had overpowered death once. And he knew that Jesus would do it again. We have the knowledge that Jesus has already done it himself. He was dead. And he rose to life. And I was just struck in reading this to you today. Did you see how Lazarus came out? I'm picturing in my head a, a, a church minister um, years ago when I was in university. He came out with like a bag on his head and pretended to be Lazarus all wrapped up in his clothes. Um, do you remember how the clothes were when Jesus came out of the tomb? They were wrapped up and sitting nicely on the end of the bed. Lazarus, he just got out of it 
and had to be released from his grave clothes, and yet Jesus came right in. He himself has come back to life again. Jesus promises to bring you back to life again. I, I hope, I hope that I'm not doing any more funerals, especially not yours, <laughs> anytime soon. But when that day comes, know that Jesus promises this resurrection to you. Go to him for faith, uh, with faith, for grace and mercy in our time of need. Uh, and third, let this, give, let, this, let this passage give you hope in the death of a loved one. Right? When we mourn uh, the, the loss of a loved one, Jesus is, is right there with us. Jesus weeps with us. He is not unmoved by what we are experiencing. He, he knows the pain of, of loss. He can handle sweeping statements like, Lord, if you had done something, so-and-so would not have died. Um, why has this happened? Right? He knows that this is how we pray when our hearts ache. So go with hearts full of faith to him and pray for that grace. And know that if your loved one has put their faith in Jesus, you will see them again. They will be raised to life, to live eternally with God. Let that give you hope and comfort. When we believe in Jesus, he will resurrect us and give us life, just as he did for Lazarus. Do you believe this? Let's pray. Jesus, thank you. <laughs> thank you for doing this, for raising Lazarus to life, for, for, for ensuring that it was written down, for preserving it over 2,000 years so we could hear it today and see the resurrecting, life-giving power of God explode from that tomb. Lord, may it deepen our faith in you. Many of us have heard this story before. May it not lose its potency. The dead man lived, and so too shall we when we trust in you. Lord, we don't know when that day comes. You alone know. But I pray, Lord, that you would be with each and every one of us. We pray that if we have loved ones in hospice and palliative care right now, that, that they would know and experience the hope that, 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 that Lazarus' story holds out to us. God, give us courage and strength to share this with others that they may believe. And Lord, may this revelation of you as the resurrection and the life give us unshakable hope as we see death approaching. We thank you for the hope that you hold out for us. We thank you for the cross, but not just the cross, the empty tomb that demonstrates that you are alive and so too shall we live in you. Thank you for that promise. May we build our life on it. We pray in Jesus' name.